few minutes. Um, I understand you guys have some signs you'd like to hold up. There will not be signs allowed here tonight. You'll be blocking people's view and they won't be able to hear the speakers. So, sorry guys, you can do them outside and you can talk to the, the press or whatever, but no signs in here tonight. Okay, folks, I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. Um, so my name is Shannon Heapy. I'm with the Air Quality Permits Program. I'm going to be acting as hearing officer this evening. Uh, thank you for all coming out. I appreciate it in this weather and the heat. I'm a northern girl. This is killing me. Uh, <laughs> so I have like a big statement to read, and it's including some um, uh, housekeeping items. So it's going to be a little bit of a longer statement than I usually have to read. So bear with Okay. Oh, I should introduce first. Um, also here from the Department of Environment tonight is Mr. Angelo Bianca. He's our Deputy Air Director. And Ms. Sana Sarasak is our Air Quality Permits Program Manager. She's also handling the permit. And the company is going to be, <laughs> the company is going to be represented tonight by Mr. Von Green. So this company is, excuse me, the public hearing is being held to accept comments from the public for an air quality permit application submitted by Von Green Funeral Services for the installation of one human crematory. The proposed installation would be located at their funeral home at 4905 York Road, Baltimore. The department has made a tentative determination that the crematory will meet all applicable federal and state air quality rules and regulations and may be issued. This hearing is to offer the public the opportunity to formally comment on the department's tentative determination and draft permit conditions. They can all, uh, you all are uh, welcome to submit comments in writing, which I will give you more information on that. Um, notification for the original date for this hearing was published July 17, 2024, Baltimore Sun. Notification of the date change for this hearing appeared in the Baltimore Sun on July 24th and July 31st. Additionally, all local elected officials within a one mile radius of the location were notified by email, as was everyone on the interested parties list, and the information was added to the MDE website. And if you go on to our MDE website on the very front page, um, there on the right hand side, well, on the right hand side, um, there is a, a link for Von Green, and you can also submit comments through that link. So a docket of information containing the air quality application, tentative determination, and draft permit conditions is available on the MDE website under the air tab, the same location, you click on that link. And that docket will be updated as we continue this process. So here's the housekeeping part. The first will be the order of statements. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Sarasak is going to read her statement uh, about the tenant determination and the draft permit conditions and the fact sheet into the formal record. And then I'm going to invite um, our elected officials to come up and to make a statement if they would like to. And then I'm going to invite Mr. Von Green to come up and make a statement if he would like to. After the um, officials um, and Mr. Green have made statements, I will invite people who have signed in on the sign-in sheets that they would like to make a statement. Um, I have you guys marked off where you checked off yes. I'll be calling those fill up first. There'll be a uh, three minute time limit and I'm going to call you up in groups of five. You can come over here and sit down here because it could be a few minutes obviously. Get comfy. And then when you're done I'm going to ask you to go over to the far table. Um, one of our court, we have two court reporters tonight um, and the camera at the far end is going to be verifying your information so we make sure that all the right statements, this is formal, that the right statements, the right spellings, all of that is, is taken care of. So, <clears throat> okay, after that. And then um, after we've um, invited everybody up who has signed in, um, if someone then chooses to make a statement, I'll invite those folks up after that. So everybody will have a chance to do that. Um, and here's the second rule, the basic rules of consideration. Um, please give the same consideration to people making statements that you would expect when giving your statement. Please do not interrupt or talk over anyone giving testimony and do not applaud. That takes time out of people's avail availability to speak. Um, any disruption can cause the court reporter to miss part or all of the statement. You do want to make sure that your comments are recorded properly. So again, please don't speak over anybody else. Um, there are a number of microphones along here. So as great as that can be for getting what people are saying, it will also pick up background noise. So you want to be careful that you don't cause too much of that. <laughs> um, and again, no personal attacks will be accepted tonight. If someone begins personal attack, I will ask them to leave. And please keep your statements to the topic, I'm sorry, the topic of air pollution concerns 
um, in this draft permit. We understand there are a lot of other concerns, but this permit is, is limited to air quality, um, and that's the part that's going to be reviewed and, and um, addressed in the uh, response to comments document that will be given up to everybody after the end of the comment period. Now, the comment period has been extended till um, uh, uh, August 29th, so um, up until that day, feel free to call me if you have questions, email me your comments if you want to, or you can mail them by post to the department to my attention. I have business cards out on the front table, um, and in your agenda, um, that side of the agenda should have my contact information as well. So, um, <clears throat> so oh, and as I started to say, so the, the last part is going to be the presentation of the comments. So um, again, I'm, this, this, what I have up here isn't necessarily the order in which you signed in, it's the order in which I got the sign-in sheets. But I will call everybody who has, um, so that they'd like to make a statement. And then again, at the end of that, after each person gets three minutes, I will invite anybody up who didn't think they wanted to make a comment, but now they want to. And then if we still have time, which I don't know, we have to be out of here by 8.30, so we're gonna hustle. Um, but if we do still have time, um, I'll invite folks to come back up and, and uh, add on to their statements that they made earlier. I do have a favor, if anyone has a really long statement that might take longer than two or uh, three minutes to read, if you could summarize what you wanna say and then hand that statement over to the court reporter, the entire statement will be added to the record. But because we're in a limited time frame, we're gonna to wanna to make sure that everybody has the option. So if you have a 10 minute speech, just kind of bring it bring it on down, okay? Um, what else? Yeah, any different statements that will work? Okay. And I got part of this done already. So at the conclusion of the comment period, again, August 29th, all the comments received in writing during the comment period will be reviewed and addressed in making a final determination to issue or to deny the permit. The response to comments document will be prepared by the department, sent to the commenters and those who participated in the public review process for this application and to all the elected officials. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, a notice of final determination will be placed in the legal section of a newspaper of general circulation in the area. That's required by statute. That's how we're doing all of these. The, the meetings and the hearings and the notifications are all by statute. Um, <clears throat> we will also place the information on the MDE um, webpage under that same tag for bond. All of this will be added to that. Um, and then at the end, any person contending that they will be adversely affected by the department's final determination may seek remedy within the circuit court system of Maryland. A petition for judicial review must be filed in the circuit court, Baltimore City, um, within 30 days after the publication of a notice of final determination. You will be emailed the same day that the, published, that the newspaper notice is published, so it will be that very same day. Um, so you can start your 30-day your clock. Ms. Arasak will give a statement about the tenant determination and fact sheet. And then I'll take the comments for the record. And again, um, this is really important because we do this um, with a response to comments document. And because there may be people who would like to know what's going on and won't have a you know, chance, couldn't come tonight. Um, two things. One is this is being recorded um, by MDE and it will be put up on the MDE YouTube channel. Um, I'm not sure how long, a couple of days, I guess, to get it prepared. Um, but it will be available then. The entire hearing will be available at that point. Um, so that should work out for some folks, I hope. Um, and um, I got everything else here. October 22nd, yep. Yeah. Um, and um, if you ask questions as part of your testimony, we're not going to address those tonight. Um, we take them as testimony, but at the end uh, of the comment period, when we put that response to comments document together, we'll have the question and we'll have the answers. That way, everybody gets to hear what your question and concern was and then what the answer is. So that's the most fair way for everybody who's interested to find out what, you know, what was going on, who was asking, what, you know, which questions were being asked. So um, with that, I'm going to uh, ask Sana to take over. Hi, thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, before I get started, I just want to have, say one clarification. The comment period is actually open through October 22nd, 2024. She, uh, Shannon was saying August 29th, but there's been a one-time 60-day extension already requested. So it is open through October 22nd, 2024, and we'll have a, uh, uh, a slide up here that gives you all that information as well. Just a clarification. So good evening, everyone. My name is Sunny E. Sarasak. I'm the manager of the Air Quality Permits Program and the Air Quality Permit Engineer who reviewed the permit application and drafted the permit for the proposed project. 
The Maryland Department of the Environment has reviewed the application submitted by Bond Green Funeral Services, PA, for an air quality permit to construct that would authorize the installation of a Matthews Environmental Solutions Power Pack 2 Plus 175 pounds per hour human crematory. The proposed location for the human crematory is 4905 York Road, Baltimore, Maryland, 21212 in Baltimore City. So during the technical review of this application, I think at the, step, the uh, community status update meeting, we talked about how we were going to go ahead and begin the technical review of the application. What we need to do is determine or estimate the emissions that we believe will be coming out of this proposed human crematory. So some of the methods that we use to estimate emissions, um, we, we recognize that we had some crematory emission factors and standards that might have been outdated and hadn't been updated in quite a while. Uh, this is kind of a, an issue that has been going on on the East Coast. So we've been working with the Mid-Atlantic Regional Air Management Administration, they're also called MOLAMA, um, to develop a best practices guidance document for estimating emissions from crematory operations. Other agencies that are involved in MOLAMA and in this work group include Delaware, the District of Columbia, New Jersey, North Carolina, Central Pennsylvania, Virginia, West Virginia, Philadelphia, and Allegheny County, Pennsylvania. And we have been meeting monthly since before December 2023 to go over all of our methods and procedures for estimating emissions from crematories so that we are developing and working together to get the most current recent inventory information for estimating emissions from human cremation. So current 2020 US EPA um, emission guidelines or emissions inventory for crem cremation and 2021 Bay Area California guidance documents have been established as appropriate methods by this best practices or this work group that we're working on to estimate emissions from crematory. So that's what the department did. So um, I didn't want to show you a bunch of boring tables and numbers, but they are available online in tables one, two, and three of the department's tentative determination document. They are online. Um, the expected emissions, you can find all of that, and the impact of the emissions are in that tentative determination document in uh, the the docket 0920, I believe is what it is online. Um, the permittee is not expected to be a major source of particulate matter, volatile organic compounds, oxides of nitrogen, sulfur oxides, or carbon monoxide. In addition, emissions of toxic air pollutants are estimated to be less than the allowable limits determined to be protective of public health. So what are the applicable air quality requirements that we have to use in, in order, that the applicant has to demonstrate compliance with in order to receive an air quality permit from the department? The first applicable air quality requirement is an opacity limit. Then there's a particulate matter emissions limit. They also have to use control technology that reduces toxic air pollutant emissions. And they also have to demonstrate compliance with our toxic air pollutant ambient impact requirement. The opacity limit. That's found in the Code of Maryland Regulations 26110804. This prohibits visible emissions from the human crematory, except water vapor, that's steam. And then also during certain operations, such as startup or adjustments or occasional cleaning, as long as they don't occur for more than six consecutive minutes in a 60 minute period and it's not greater than 40%. So, how are they going to demonstrate com compliance with the opacity limit? The permit requires them to equip the human crematory with an opacity sensor. It's going to be interlocked with a control system that alerts the operator, continuously monitors the stack gases for visible emissions during operation, and then it adjusts the cremation operations to prevent visible emissions from exiting the crematory stack. In addition, they're also going to be required to conduct an initial US EPA Method 9 opacity observation. This must be performed by an independent third party to conduct the test, and that's going to be required in the permit. Also, all of our air quality compliance program staff that will inspect the facility are certified to conduct method nine observations and will conduct these observations during inspection. Particulate matter emissions limit. The human crematory must meet the Code of Maryland Regulations 2611-0805-B2A. This limits the concentration of particulate matter in the exhaust gases from the human <coughs> crematory to 0 0.10 grains per standard cubic foot of dry exhaust gas. To demonstrate compliance with the particulate matter standard, the permitting will be either required to conduct the stack emissions testing 
to demonstrate compliance with the applicable particular matter emissions limit using uh, EPA reference method five, or they may provide a stack test report conducted within the last five years by an independent third party stack testing company on an identical crematory unit. Okay, the to toxic air pollutant control technology requirements. COMAR 2611-1505 requires a permittee to implement best available control technology or TBACT for toxics to control emissions of toxic air pollutants. For crematories, TBACT is identified as having, a, ha having the crematory be equipped with a secondary combustion chamber that's capable of meeting at least a one second retention time and a minimum operating temperature of 1600 degrees Fahrenheit. The crematory must have a temperature sensor and monitor continues to measure and record the temperature of the secondary combustion chamber. And the exhaust gases must be vented out of a stack at a height of at least 40 feet from the ground to ensure proper dispersion of the exhaust gases. Finally, Maryland has a very stringent toxic air pollutant ambient impact requirement. Not every state has this, and that's something that we found out when we were working with the Marimo War Group, that our toxic air pollutant requirements are far more stringent than other states. The Code of Maryland Regulation 2611-1506 prohibits the discharge of toxic air pollutants at levels that would unreasonably endanger human health. When we talk about unreasonably endangering human health, we, the department or the regulation set protective levels for toxic air pollutants. For each toxic air pollutant, there is a level that is set at one one hundredth of the work level allowed for worker exposure at the facility itself. So at their property line, they cannot exceed one one hundredth of that number, so one percent of that number, that a worker that's working at the facility could be exposed to from an occupational standpoint. They have to be below that level. If the toxic air pollutant is considered carcinogenic, there are additional protective levels that are added to ensure continuous exposure to that toxic air pollutant for a period of 70, 70 years would not cause an increase in lifetime cancer risk of more than one in 100,000. So to demonstrate compliance with this air toxic ambient impact requirement, the applicant is subject to a number of limits. They can only cremate human remains in the crematory and they cannot cremate more than two human remains during any eight hour period. In addition to that, they can't combust anything halogenated like halogenated plastics including PVC body bags or polyvinyl chloride body bags or PVC pipes. And they can't combust anything that's considered hazardous waste or hospital, medical, or infectious waste. They have to conduct stack emissions testing for emissions of metallic toxic air, pollutant, air pollutants including mercury to demonstrate compliance, or the permit may provide a stack test report conducted within the last five years by an independent third party stack testing company on an independent crematory unit. Sure. So what we found with the stack test reports in this Marama work group is that almost all of them were fairly consistent from crem crematory to crematory. So this is what we've proposed in the permit. In addition, there are a lot of other added protective measures in this permit. We recognize that this is an environmental justice area. The things that we have added to ensure continuous compliance are above and beyond any other crematory in the state of Maryland. Not only the stack testing requirement, the opacity sensor requirement, but they must also develop and maintain an operations and maintenance plan that's approved by the department. And the plan has to include the proper procedures for proper operation and maintenance, <coughs> periodic monitoring, what they're monitoring, what they're looking for, what the values are, all the records that they have to keep, and if they had to do anything or make any corrective actions, what those corrective actions are and what they're supposed to do. In addition to that, they have to keep lots of records. Continuous records of flue gas temperature at the outlet of the secondary combustion chamber. Also for each cremation, they have to have logs that show the date and start time of each cremation, the approximate weight of each charge, and the duration of each cremation cycle. They also have to have records of the description of the remains, the place of origin, the record of receipt, accompanying materials to be cremated, and an identification of materials removed from the remains prior to cremation. They also have to keep records of all maintenance performed on the crematory, including the date and description of the maintenance performed and the actions taken. They have to keep a copy of the o and plan after it's approved by the department. And they have to keep records of all the results of the capacity observations and stack emissions tests performed. So as I stated previously, the conditions of this draft permit to construct, such as the opacity sensor, the staff testing requirements, the O&M plan, the operation maintenance plan, 
represents the most stringent requirements that we have ever, the department has ever put in a prior to use job for a human crematory in the state of Maryland. They have to demonstrate initial compliance with these requirements and apply for and obtain a state operating permit. If they are unable to demonstrate this initial compliance within the initial 180 day temporary operating payment, they won't have a full permit to operate to operate this crematory. In addition, as a state permit to operate source, they have to annually certify their actual emissions of regulated pollutants from the facility, and they must report all occurrences of excess emissions. On top of this, there are many other requirements this crematory is subject to outside of the air quality permit to construct. One is the requirements from the Baltimore City Board of Municipal and Zoning Appeals, or BMCA. This limits the type of human remains that can be processed in the crematory, crematory unit to only those owned, operated, controlled by Von Green, so it's not going to be a commercial operation where they can bring in uh, human remains that are not affiliated with their company. And also, they can only process human remains that have had all teeth containing mercury amalgams removed. This is kind of important because we're still having them test for mercury. We're still having them test for other metals because in the event that they weren't removing the mercury amalgams, we want to know or we want to see if there's any mercury emissions. And all of our emissions estimates are based on the fact that they did not remove the mercury amalgams. So the two human or the two cremations per eight hour period is based on the protective level for mercury as if there is still mercury in those human remains, even though the zoning requirement requires them to remove them before cremation. In addition to department environment requirements, there's Maryland Department of Health requirements. The State Board of Morticians and Funeral Directors also regulate and inspect crematory facilities and require training for crematory operators. They, have, they require that all hazardous objects be removed from human remains and cremation containers and then properly disposed of before cremation. Cremation containers must also comply with all local, state, local, state, and federal governmental emissions regulations. So I'm going to leave this up here after we call for comments. But that's a, that's basically my public hearing, hearing statement. But we did I did want to clarify again: written comments can be submitted through October 22nd, 2024. So let me just open that I guess up to comment. And you said three minutes, Shannon? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to put a timer up here for three minutes. It's going to be a loose three minutes. We'll see how long this goes. You get more. <laughs> so, Senator, do you want to do that? I think it was a question. Just, is, is there a list of the hazardous materials and the infectious medical um, waste that you're worried about on your website that we can look at? Oh. You said that, you said no, no remains that have infectious medical waste or hazardous materials to be cremated. Is there a list of what's considered those things somewhere? Okay, so the hazard, hazardous materials uh, that have to be removed are regulated by the Department of Health, so they do have a list of those materials that are required to be removed. They cannot actually be handed over the, the cremated remains cannot be handed over to Vaughn Green for cremation until those are removed. Okay, again, um, okay, folks, again, um, hold off asking questions um, for your testimony so we can make sure it's all recorded as part of the formal comments and then we can formally address them. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. I hope you're all staying cool. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. For the record, I'm Senator Mary Washington. I represent the 43rd Legislative District. And just to be clear, what we're talking about is air pollution. Um, so, and the requirement that under Maryland law, um, anyone that the Maryland Department of the Environment evaluate any new source of pollution. So it's already, of course, been determined that a crematory is a new source of air pollution. Um, and therefore, the department must de determine and can determine whether or not a proposed use uh, complies with all of our air quality regulations and meets all our air quality standards uh, when evaluating the application. So as a part of the application process, uh, this evaluation, the department notifies and engages the public. Um, and that's why we're here today. I just want to make sure we're all on the 
same page. Um, so on June 8, 2020, Vaughn Green Services submitted an air quality permit to construct. And that permit was to add uh, a crematorium to their existing funeral home. And that's an allowable conditional use. It's not a by right use, it's a, a conditional use. And the department held its first public meeting um, on December, 20, 20, uh, December 2nd, 2020. And since then, it's met with the public at least three times. So we've had at least three times where we've talked about this particular application. And at every single meeting, there has been strong opposition and serious concern expressed by not only residents that live directly adjacent to it, but individuals who are tracking human health across the state and in some cases across the country. So as a representative of this jurisdiction and the people uh, directly impacted, I, I stand with these committed residents here, uh, the businesses and the property owners who relentlessly uh, oppose uh, the siding of a human crematorium less than 500 feet from homes that are already impacted by poor air quality. So dozens of neighborhoods from Guilford to Lock Raven to Woodburn to Perrin Lock, Lake Evesham to Govins all have come forward to express their opposition, resulting in a united front. How often does that happen in Baltimore? Um, hundreds of individual signatures and hours of testimony asking the department to deny this permit application. Uh, students from Loyola and Notre Dame, uh, church leaders, neighborhood associations, environmentalists, all have had the same message. Please do not allow a human crematorium to be built in a densely populated Baltimore City neighborhood. But, however, the numbers here tonight do not accurately reflect the, wild, the widespread and fervent opposition. While, again, it fills this room, uh, it does not uh, reflect the, mem the many people who have. Uh, many are absent due to the expeditious scheduling of this hearing. The first notice was given July 25th. The hearing was scheduled less than a month, uh, 23 days to be exact, and then we see that the actual public notice was even later than that. It was July 25th, so sort of less than two weeks. So as such, the community has had to scramble to thoroughly review the draft to gather their thoughts and comments to make time to attend this hearing, demonstrating their unwavering commitment. Additionally, just last night, just not for nothing, it's very hot in this room, and it is known that there is no air conditioning in this room, and that last night a number of city events were canceled uh, due to heat, so I just want to make a note of that as well. So scheduling and hearing so quickly uh, curtailed the efficacy of the department's public messaging and its public engagement process. And in, in fact, it raised an unnecessarily and unavoidable barrier to inclusive and transparent permit review, which is what we are here today. So the department and the stakeholders responsible for preserving public health should note that tonight's public testimony is incomplete. I sent the department a letter of concern and asked them to reschedule this hearing to September to allow more public participation, the day after Labor Day, as a matter of fact. But obviously that request was not accepted. If anyone's interested in receiving a copy of this letter, please contact my office. Now while the draft permit conditions, now onto the permit, uh, it does reflect an important step forward. The permit commissions can still, however, be strengthen to further protect health and safety of neighboring communities. The department and state has an obligation, regardless of zoning, regardless of allowable use, ultimately and fundamentally, it is our responsibility to protect communities from undue harm. The need for tighter regulations and management of even small incinerators is vital to this process. And it is very urgent that especially in areas already overburdened by pollution and other environmental hazards such as MTA, the MTA bus line, another sort of fun fact, it's the highest, it has the, the greatest traffic of MTA buses traveled down the York Road corridor. Uh, a crematory 
even when we close some of these uh, gaps to improve human health, a crematory does emit toxic pollutants such as mercury, lead, and dioxins that damage the environment, the trees as well as human health, and people who live near it. And as was mentioned earlier, that the proposed crematory site is within an area that has an environmental justice score of 95. What that means is that it is more environmentally burdened than 95% of the communities in the state. 95%. Okay. So the pollution burden in combination with the direct exposure and proximity of air pollution, like factories and roadways and fast food places, and the cumulative impact of this says that what we should be doing is rather than adding more pollution to the harm for these areas, we should be striving to establish health equity and true environmental justice regardless of the safety measures and permit conditions imposed. This incinerator will still produce harmful emissions in the area already burdened. The potential harm to the community cannot be overstated. And as I said, the air quality permit should not, or I'll say now, Ultimately, my comment, while you know, there have been adjustments, that the permit should not be granted. Um, additionally, the department should continue, should it decide to approve, it must strengthen the permit conditions to mitigate harm. Uh, so we conferred with resident experts, some environmental ed engineers, I'm sure you might hear some of this, uh, environmental health scientists, uh, with decades of experience, and there are at least three suggestions. One, the recurring stat test. Testing once, a, once every five years or testing another stat somewhere else is just not, uh, is not acceptable. Um, there should actually be recurring st uh, stat tests throughout that five year uh, period. Um, and that the crematory is to ensure that it is operated within regulatory limits. Also, while we did note that the Baltimore Board of Zoning or Baltimore regulations uh, require removal of synthetic plastics, we'd, li we'd like to actually see that in the, the permit. Additionally, in the permit, the provisions that only bodies currently owned or operated, sorry, only bodies from currently owned or operated by Bond Green can be sent. These requested additions are more than reasonable, and their inclusion should demonstrate that the department, the state of Maryland, abides by its mission to protect and restore the environment for the health and well-being of Marylanders. The proposed development or approval of a conditional use has been contested since June 2020. It's not the, the length of time or how long someone's waited should not come into consideration. In other words, part of the reason I was given why this was held so quickly is that, well, the, the operator it is, has been waiting a long time. Well, I would say these communities have been waiting a long time to breathe clean air. They've been waiting a long time to understand that their health matters, that their communities matter, and they've been waiting a long time to stop simply uh, saying that we stand for environmental justice. Well, what do they say? Instead of just talking about it, be about it. And so they've been waiting for that. So this community has, sent, has sought every avenue to stop this. And it's not about preventing a business from meeting customer demands. In fact, there's another location that is not adjacent to any commercial properties that the owner could in fact this. And we understand that uh, the use of cremation as a choice is increasing in popularity. And, and in fact, we should note that when these laws were written and the regulations were written, only 10% of the population used cremation as an option for the final disposition. Now upwards of 60 to 75% of people are projected to use that. So again, if we're still using standards that were based on 
when now it's actually going to be upwards of 60 to 7 percent from the very beginning is going to be uh, under under uh, evaluated it's not going to be evaluated properly so again as I said for too long we've allowed the desires of business to overtake the consideration of the destruction that might be to our environment we cannot afford to allow this situation to persist uh, I will not stand for it as your representative. We have to prioritize. We can feel the temperature. We see the rain. We see the changes in the environment. Continuing to contribute to this as simply a trade-off for economic development is just no longer palatable. So at this point, the Department of the Environment is the only agency that can do what's necessary to protect the lives of the people in this room and their families and their businesses. I urge you to take this responsibility and stand up for the public health and do not grant this air quality permit. Thank you. Mr. Green up. Is he here yet? Yes. Good evening, everyone. First of all, I'd like to express my appreciation to the Huber Church for their hospitality in hosting this meeting and their concern for the community and allowing the community to engage in this environment. I want to thank the Maryland Department of the Environment for all the hard work that they've done over the last four years in working on this process. I'm sure it's been stressful for them. Uh, and I want to thank everyone who is here this evening. And I certainly want to thank those persons that for the last 20 years or so have been uh, faithful to um, the partnership that uh, the East Baltimore community has had with Vine Green Funeral Services. My name is Vine Green. Uh, I am a licensed funeral director in the state of Maryland. I'm the owner of Vine Green, Green Funeral Services. I started working at a funeral home when I was 15 years old. My grandfather was friends with a local funeral director, and my father impacted me the benefits of hard work, got me a job working for a funeral home in West Baltimore. My job was maintaining the parking lot, mowing lawns, uh, vacuuming the carpet, maintenance type work. And I worked for him throughout high school. I'm a product of Baltimore City Elementary School, junior high, senior high, and I went to college in the state of Maryland. Once I graduated from high school, I knew funeral service was my calling. I feel it's a God-ordained professional, God-ordained calling. So I went to mortuary school. Got my degree in mortuary science and I went back to the funeral home that I worked for as a youngster. I was promoted as manager. I worked for James Morton Funeral Homes in West Baltimore for 15 years before I founded Vine Green Funeral Services with my partner Bill Miller in 1996. A lot of changes have taken place in funeral service over the time that I've been in funeral service. I'm not going to tell you how old I am now, but I've been doing this since I was 15. And the only other job I had was a paper route. Uh, so I've been hanging around the funeral industry for a long time. 50% of the citizens of the state of Maryland choose cremation as the mode of disposition. Actually, in the United States, it's higher. In some geographies, it's as high as 70 to 80%. In my community, because I mainly serve the African-American community, right now, about 30 to 40% of that number is cremation, and it's increasing every year. These are services that the community is requesting from me. What I'm not I'm marketing. I'm not marketing cremation. Uh, I'm providing these services because these are the services that the community that I serve is requesting from me. I'm simply trying to provide services that the people need. And the people are requesting of me without having to put them through the uncomfortable process of having their family member outsource outside of the city where they live. 
As it stands right now, when a family entrusts their loved one to my care for cremation services, I have to outsource their decedent to a third party vendor. That third party vendor is not located in Baltimore City. So the decedent from Baltimore City has to be transported to Baltimore County to a crematory that handles those services. These are life long residents of Baltimore City. These are persons who are part of the very fabric of what Baltimore City is. And they have to be transported outside of the city that they love because those services are not available for them in the community where they live. I am one of the trusted community partners that the family decides to call when they are in need of these services. If they wanted to use a cremation vendor in Catonsville outside of the city, they would have simply called those persons. They call me to minister to them in their season of need. Me having to entrust them to a third party, this third party that I have to entrust them to, the family doesn't even know. So they have to go through the stress and anxiety of a family member being transported to a vendor that they're not familiar with. And personally, I have to absorb the liability. If there's an issue, I can't contain or control my liability because if a third party vendor has an accident, the liability is on Vine Green Funeral Services because they trusted their family member to my care. I have been a trusted community partner for more than 25 years. And the African American community has provided tremendous support in the partnership with Vine Green Funeral Service. I would never, please hear me clearly, I would never ever bring services to the people that I serve, the people that I worship with, the people that I play golf with, the people that I network with. I would never bring services to those people that I thought were harmful. The reality is there's opposition, but there's also significant support. I have pastors in their churches that I've served and they have served their communities. I have letters of support where pastors representing over 20,000 parishioners support having this service available in their community. They want to, don't want to continue to see their members and their family members outsourced to Baltimore County because these services aren't available to Baltimore City residents. I have served over 18,000 families that have put their confidence and trust in me. They wouldn't be doing that if they didn't trust me. Three to 350 families every year call me for cremation services. Those decedents have parents, sisters, brothers, friends, and by calling me for cremation suggest that they are supporting this process. Because if they didn't support this process, they wouldn't be calling me and asking me to provide these services locally. The reality is, there's more support for this project than opposition. There are 100 people in this room. She just mentioned eight to 10 communities. And there are hundreds of people in this room. I get 100 phone calls a month encouraging me to keep on to provide these services to the people that are calling on me. That being said, we have selected Matthews and Ryan. I had asked everyone to please not talk over people. I want you to show the respect that we will be showing to you. So please let Mr. Green finish his statement, and then I'll be inviting everybody. I'm gonna leave because this is a joke. Okay. Okay. So I'm gonna leave. No problem. But I have six family members. I live less than 200 feet from there. I can walk out my yard. Look right there, and Vaughn Green is there. I have grandchildren down there, my mom and me. Right? So it's a joke. It's disrespectful to us. Don't leave, Sandy. Don't leave, Sandy. Don't leave, Sandy. Don't leave, Sandy. Come back. 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 And I'm sorry my sister feels that way, and please don't put her out, but allow her to continue to be here and express her opinion and be a part of this process. We selected Matthews Environmental Solutions for this project. They're the market leader nationally and internationally for cremation equipment. 
I knew in serving this community, I wanted the very best in terms of technology and the very best that was available. I knew that this company was known for that. They have a reputation of being the best out there, and that is why I sought them for this project. They will continue to be an important partner in the operation of the facility. If nothing else, because I know that that's what the community wants. They want oversight. I'd like to emphasize, I would never do anything harmful to the community I serve. I have employees and family members who work at the York Road location. I would never put them or anybody else at risk. Crematoriums operate safely in every county in the state of Maryland. And all over the United States of America, cremation has been around since biblical days. There's just one just north of me in Towson, that, and there's another in West Baltimore. There haven't been any issues, because if there were, they would certainly be highlighted. There's nothing that nobody has found that suggested that a crematory in Maryland has been responsible for illnesses and catastrophic challenges involving people. If there were, those issues were being raised, and the reasons that they're not being raised is because those issues aren't, don't exist. I began this process fully aware that the Maryland Department of Environment has a reputation for having amongst the strictest emission standards in the country. The emissions from our facility will be way under those standards. As a lifelong Maryland resident, thank you for the work you do. Uh, and in conclusion, I'd like to say that the opposition likes to refer to the crematorium as an incinerator. Incinerators incinerate trash, refuge, garbage. The parents, the brothers and sisters, the children, the family members who have services with the urn present, who put their remains, cremains in jewelry and wear it around their neck. They don't consider their family members trash. It is not an incinerator. The crematorium is a control process that is approved method for the final disposition of human beings. Thank you so much for the privilege of allowing me to share. Again, thank you, MDE Huber Church. And again, thank all of you. Some of you I've served over the years. Pray that that, continue, that partnership continues to move forward. And may God continue to bless you in this community and may heaven continue to smile upon you. Is my prayer. How close do you live to the incinerator? Howard County. That's where you live. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to call people up five at a time to come and sit, <laughs> to sit over here, and then we'll speak. When, when this first five goes, I'll call the next five, etc. They will be a three-minute um, timer. I think someone's going to have that up there for you. <clears throat> and again, it isn't necessarily the order in which you signed in. It's just the order that I have the, the um, uh, sign-in sheets. But we will get to everybody.
thank you for your patience. Sorry. Make sure I get all this right. Um, okay, so Mr. Hopkins, if you want to come up, what I need you to do is state your name and spell it for the court reporters. My name is Jeff Tompkins. Jeff Tompkins, uh, J-E-F-F-T-O-M-P-K-I-N-S. Uh, I'm, I'm here uh, because we, my community, who I'm very proud of because they've stood up for themselves and the help of our neighbors, uh, has opposed this, uh, in this uh, crematorium uh, vociferously for a long time. And I think it's very important to point out why was the word incinerator even brought up here? It's because it, incinerators are not allowed in residential areas. Uh, and I believe that it is a, a very arbitrary kind of distinction to say that incineration of human remains are somehow different qualitatively than incinerator of anything else. Uh, so. It's my opinion that BMZA should never have uh, approved the permit to begin with, um, but that's where we are right now. Uh, what I wanted to say to MBE is that uh, I work in computer science uh, and analyze data a lot. Data is very important to uh, tell the story, to address to prove the, the uh, compliance. And I believe uh, the one thing that I would want to say is this must not be a one and done sort of thing. The data needs to be meaningful and it needs to be of the stack and it needs to be repeated so that we can be assured uh, of our health. The reason also that we have vociferously uh, opposed this uh, crematory is that 95% environmental justice score is 95% bad, any additional pollution is adding on to an already yeah. bad situation. Yeah. Any, any pollution, any additional pollution. Um, so we don't want it. If it's here, we need to have it continuously monitored in a meaningful way. Um, so that we can be assured of the science and the data it needs to be transparent uh, and i believe that is furthering the mission of mde to keep us keep the residents of maryland safe that's primary um, so i would just like to say um, keep the data real keep us safe and um, Keep the standards up to date. That's all I Sephora Horowitz, that's T-Z-I-P-P-O-R-A-H, and then the last name is H-O-R-O-W-I-T-Z. Um, I work with the Chesapeake Climate Action Network. Um, thank you for the opportunity to submit comments on this permit for the installation of a Matthews Environmental Solutions Power Pack 2 Plus Human Crematorium. Uh, we carefully re reviewed the permit application after attending the meeting on December 13, 2023 on the proposal. Uh, before addressing the specific technical complaints with the draft permit as written, we would like to highlight several factors that weigh heavily into our concerns about the proposal. MDE has not sufficiently taken into account the strong community opposition to the project. MDE's permitting system for crematoria is not designed for a source of this kind with, uh, with population density like this, and the area chosen for this project is already overburdened with other environmental pollutants, is a hot spot for asthma and other conditions, making the proposed facility an extraordinary burden on an already suffering community. MDE should apply increased scrutiny to permits for air uh, applications for air pollution sources in and near zip codes with high scores on environmental justice scorecards as rated by the EPA. 
As the process moved forward, NDE should take into account the fa uh, several factors to assure that the best available technology to reduce the risk to human health is available to the community. The United Nations Environmental Program has laid out best practices for crematoria operations in the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutions for UN Standards. Based on these UN standards, we have several concerns with the permit as written. First, the permit uh, lists the equipment as the Matthews Power Pack 2 Model uh, Plus IE43 PP2 Plus. I asked for the technical uh, uh, specifications from the company and reviewed them. Uh, it only measures opacity, not carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide monitoring is the best practice because monitoring for this colorless gas can be an early indicator that some part of the process has gone wrong in a way that could harm human health. Carbon monoxide is sometimes used by the EPA as a proxy pollutant for hazardous air pollutants, or HAPs, generally because both can be byproducts of incomplete combustion. Therefore, MBE should pay particular attention to this flaw. The equipment listed in the permit is also intended to run automatically for long periods of time without staff on site. A key component of crematorium safety is the ability to react when equipment malfunctions. A polluting facility of this size in a densely populated area must have staff on site to reduce response times when equipment fails. The standard process for reviewing crematorium permits, as MDE conceded at its public meeting, is insufficient for the current application uh, due to the proposed crematorium's location in a densely populated neighborhood. One key best practice to minimize equipment failures and risk to human health is to regularly inspect equipments, although MDE's current process only inspects crematory in the event of a complaint. Uh, just 10 more seconds and I will finish. Okay. Really okay. Uh, MDE should not allow Von Green to operate without a permit with inspections on a schedule recommended by UN standards. Similarly, the application does not con contain a robust monitoring system procedure despite regularly monitoring being considered a best practice. I see that that's been added. I'm curious about the details of the scheduling of the monitoring and how available those results will be to the public. And I just want to see that they're doing what they said they're going to do. Great. Oh. Yeah. My name is Vincent Smith, uh, B I N C E N T S M I T H. I don't have nothing written. Uh, basically, I'm coming off the top of my head. I lived uh, in that community all of my life, 60 plus years. And I work in the wastewater field. So I'm wondering about the, the odor that's going to come through the emissions through that building. Are uh, they going to have some sort of odor scrubber that's going to scrub the emissions coming through there? Um, that's one question I wanted to bring to the table. The other thing is, if this thing is installed in 10 years from now, we find out people starting to get cancer, because cancer is like running rapid now. So, I mean, it's children in my neighborhood. It's, it, and, and if this thing is needed, it's not for us to be penalized for it. Move it somewhere else. Buy some land somewhere out in the Hagerstown somewhere. You know, but don't put it down, down in that area. As they spoke earlier, said about it being densely populated and the pollution factor already existing, why would you do this now? I mean, y'all granting the permits. Y'all shouldn't do it. So that's all I got to say. Karen DeCamp, um, I live in Radnor, Winston, K-A-R-E-N-D-E-C-A-M-P. I just wanted a couple comments for MDE. This is a terrible time, a terrible location and place for this hearing, and it's really disrespectful to this community. This is two miles from the affected community. This is in a pretty hot room. <laughs> uh, at 5.30, which is when most working people are getting off work and trying to get over here. Um, I, I suggest that a best practice for MDE be that the permittee not be allowed to pick the time, place, location. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I want to point out just a 
couple other quick things. Um, I hear a lot from MDE about environmental justice. I hear a lot of mouthing of environmental justice. And, you know, the MDE, with its own scoring, 95 out of 100 means this location is one of the worst possible places to put another source of pollution, right? So basically, if we are committed to being about environmental justice, we should be about correcting the years of environmental injustice where we put pollution sources in black and brown communities, where we put, we gave people in those communities more than their fair share. And so we need to be about correcting that. So just issuing a permit, putting some conditions on, on it, good start, needs to be a hell of a lot stronger than that. And I think some people are gonna cover that. But I do, I just wanna read out to you, I'm gonna circle back to the issue of getting people two miles over here, right after work, it's the dinner hour. The MDE has said, quote, it's important that residents who may be adversely affected, anybody here gonna be ad adversely affected? By a proposed pollution source, be aware of current environmental issues in their community in order to have meaningful involvement in this permitting process. Hauling people here right after work, two miles away from the affected community. In August, when many people replied back to me, I can't make it, I'm not going to be here, I can't make it from work. Not great. Please, please, please correct your practices, MDE. And I, I want to say that the environmental justice part of this, the idea of correcting the injustice that we've done to black and brown communities, you have a special duty here to protect this community and make the permit conditions as strong as they possibly can. Recurring stack tests. So we have at least some information besides, gee, how, how opaque is the smoke? That's what we need from you. We need strong permit conditions. Do better. Good evening. My name is Jennifer Halstead, and I represent the Evesham Park Neighborhood Association. I'm here today to express our strong opposition for the proposed permit at Vaughn Green Funeral Services. Our concerns are rooted in the significant environmental and public health impacts that this facility would bring to an already burdened community. According to MDE, the EG score or EJ score is 95%, which has been mentioned here tonight several times. Baltimore faces significant public health challenges related to air quality, with pediatric asthma-related emergency visits occurring at more than double the statewide rate. But yet this permit would allow an incinerator to be within walking distance of three schools and two parks. When you state that there are no other crematory permit in Maryland at this time that requires this level of testing to verify emissions, I think it's a crucial to provide context, as you kind of touched on in the beginning. Well, from what I've researched, there's been no new permits issued, in, issued for crematoriums in Baltimore City since 1999. Could you confirm that is the case? If so, we ask, what were the standards that were last approved for the permit in 1999, and how have regulatory requirements evolved since then? Without this context, it is impossible to fully understand the adequacy and effectiveness of the current testing protocols. It raises serious questions on whether the proposed standards are sufficient and in good faith to protect our community's health and environment in the face of modern challenges. Additionally, but not without consequence, the environmental impact of crematoriums is substantial. On average, sites this size produce roughly 28 metric tons of CO2 annually, and it would require about 1,300 mature trees each year just to offset the carbon emissions from one crematory. This directly conflicts with Baltimore's Climate Action Plan, which aims to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by 2050. I don't think that this will get us there. We urge the board to consider these factors seriously, as you are the Maryland Department of Environment. Approving this permit would not only counteract our city's climate goals, but also place additional health burdens on our community's most vulnerable populations. Thank you for your time.
Okay, so the next five I want to bring up, if they're available, is Dave Arn, Karen Thompson, Cindy Camp, Sophie Valkenberg, and Dan Pontus. My name is uh, Dave Arndt. I'm a Baltimore resident and a co-lead of Maryland Legislature's Coalition Climate Justice Wing. And I'm uh, kind of deeply upset at uh, what's going on here and what uh, MDE is allowing. And basically I'm looking at kind of the, one of the first principles is self-regulation doesn't work. And that's what you're really saying that you really want to have happen here is self-regulation, that uh, Vaughn Green will regulate themselves and hopefully everything goes okay. And we're, you're just going like, hopefully it does, and you're judging things on estimates and maybe five years, things go good and or not so good, and then maybe we'll come back and maybe make it, do another test or maybe take a test from some other location. That is really ridiculous. We really need strong monitoring. And if you really think about everything that can come out of an incinerator, this is a human incinerator, but it is an incinerator. Uh, let's just look at things. We got PFAS. We don't even know what the limits of the, should be for PFAS right now. What happens if you're burning and PFAS are coming out? These are chemicals that do not destruct at that temperature. We've got dioxins, we've got lead, mercury, and uh, PM 2.5 that can be coming out. Well, you're coming back and saying, well, we trust Von Green that they won't be coming out. How do we really know? You need to really have monitoring, and you need to have monitoring that is reported to the public, really like on a website that we all can see, and we can see daily what is happening at the incinerator. So this is something that really needs to work. Uh, there also has to be a mandatory notification if things go wrong, not, oh, you may find out a year from now. And we need to have shutdown procedures that everybody knows about, that if something does go wrong, things will be shut down immediately. The one thing I also have to do is talk to Vaughn Green here. Uh, this last year we passed a bill in the, the state that allowed for water cremation. Why not use water cremation? You say people want to be cremated, choose a different source. You can buy water cremation now in Maryland, install it, and then we can be pollution free. So please, if you're really concerned concerned about the people in the neighborhood, install a different type of crematorium. Thank you. Hello everyone. My name is Cindy Camp and I live in 500 block of Radnor, which is less than 200 feet from the crematorium. My family, my mom is 89, my brother's bedridden has been for at least seven to eight years. I have three grandchildren, all of which has asthma, <coughs> residing right there. So if you look out my window, there's one grand. So I'm concerned about the health effects that will have on the people in the neighborhood now, five, 10, 20 years from now. Will metals and toxics settle in my yard where my grandchildren play? Will more particles in the air make worse the high childhood asthma rate on our blocks? MDE, you can't tell us whether this is safe for us now because you are using outdated emission factors. You can't tell us if this will affect our health in the future because your permit calls for one test of the smokestack on startup of the crematorium. 
do better. We want more frequent smokestack tests and limits on the number of bodies and hours of operations and more. So when you look at me, I am my community. It's a marginalized community. We have enough issues, so we don't need any more emissions or toxins in our community. We deserve better. Hi, I'm Sophie Falkenberg, S-O-P-H-I-E-V-A-L-K-E-N-B-E-R-G. Um, I'm a resident of Radnor Winston, right behind the post office, and also my dad is a lung cancer survivor, so not starting off super strong. Um, so I want to also start by calling attention to something that all of us in the room are now aware of, that the environmental justice score for the Winston Govins Winston -Govin census tract is a 95. This predominantly black community already deals with a variety of environmental pollutants like those from the 20,000 vehicles that drive through busy York Road each day. Compounding impacts from further sources hurt real people. The permit requires some additional measures because of this, but they need to be stronger. According to the EPA's EJ Screen program, the census tract of this neighborhood has a significantly higher asthma rate than the rest, than the average of the state of Maryland. On top of this, several studies have shown that childhood exposure to air pollution has been linked to a significant increase in asthma diagnoses. This health disparity demonstrates that this family-oriented community already carries a much larger stress compared to the rest of the state. Because of this, we as a community are calling for stronger regulations. We want all medical implants removed. We want required and frequently recurring stack and opacity tests for, for this specific Vaughn Green crematorium. No substitutions for similar crematoriums may be made. The MDE must update the 30-year-old particulate matter emission limit. And for this permit, we urge that the MDE use these suggested regulations along with limits on frequency of burning and the source of bodies to compensate for this outdated, outdated standard. The uh, drafted permit violates the human right to clean air of an already overburdened community. I strongly urge that the MDE reconsider this permitting decision and strengthen the current regulations and limitations. This community deserves and has a right to clean air. Do not pollute and hurt the city and community you claim to love so much. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Dan Pontius, uh, D-A-N-P-O-N-T-I-O-U-S. I, uh, since 2018, I've been the president of the Radnor Winston Improvement Association, uh, 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 right across York Road from, from the proposed crematorium. And since May, I'm the very new president of the York Road Partnership, which is a coalition of 30, more than 30 member neighborhoods and institutions along York Road. And I'd like everyone affiliated with York Road Partnership, you could stand up right now. Stand up, stand up. Let's show everybody how many people are here. These are folks in the neighborhoods along the York Road border. And we are uh, all standing together, together with people like Cindy Camp, you just heard from, who live less than 200 feet. There are people, and we, we have stated as a, as a coalition um, that we believe that this was not an appropriate site because people live so close. Uh, the BMZA, when they heard the zoning, they said, well, we, you know, we have to defer to MDE. We don't know about health, even though the city code requires them to make their own health determination. We appealed that. Uh, the appellate court of Maryland just ruled, well, no, that was okay after all. So, uh, so it's all up to you, MDE. Like, we, we, we tried other avenues to protect our citizens from the pollution from this site. And uh, the only one left, Maryland Department of the Environment, is the only entity standing between the pollution from this proposed crematorium and the families who live less than 200 feet uh, and you know, right around that crematorium. So it's all up to you. Uh, the permit kind of is proud that, that, this, that you believe this will meet all the limits, uh, uh, pollution limits. But the, um, the particulate matter emissions limit that you put on the slide uh, is, is this from 1991. Vaughn Green didn't even exist as a company, we, I just learned tonight, in 1991. This emissions limit that you're proud that they're meeting is, is very old. Since then, we've realized that PM 2.5, the very, very small particulates that come out of this kind of crematorium and all combustion, are, are much more hazardous than the bigger pollutants, which is the one that you're set to a limit for. It can lodge in the deepest recesses of the lungs. It can get into the bloodstream. And yet you are not going to regulate that whatsoever. 
from this crematorium. So that's, when people say this is an old standard, this is the old standard, the standard older than the Vaughn Green funeral home itself. Uh, and similarly, the toxic, you know, but this is only, we got two weeks notice of this uh, hearing, which is in, um, not even in the same zip code, I realized just now, too. <laughs> uh, so we're still trying to understand the permit and all the toxic uh, uh, measurements, but those toxic calculations, the big table with all the toxic estimates of pollution, those are based on some crematorium in New Jersey in 1992. So that's very old, too. So, you know, given that the limits that you are certifying that this proposed crematorium can meet are so old, and the fact that this, these communities are so vulnerable, as your own permit indicates, an environmental justice measure of 95 out of 100. So, I, I, I'll wrap up. I, and we will put, I will, we'll need more time to take a look at the permit and we will submit written comments. But I just want to point out that you are the only thing protecting people now and your standards are old, and so it's appropriate to set, uh, we're glad that you're trying to limit the bodies that come. Vaughn Green only asked to cremate bodies for 12 hours a day, six days a week. It would be nice if you put that in the permit, you gave them what they asked for. Uh, limit, so these, these types of limits, we need to take out the implants. There are a lot more implants in bodies than there were in 1992 now. The, all that emissions will go up the stack that has no pollution controls whatsoever. So there are all, we'll put more detail in the limits in the, in the comments, but I just want to make it clear, your job is to protect our public health, and the limits that you've got in this permit are not T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N. Yes, um, I've lived in the Gophers community for 54 years. My father brought me into this community at the age of 10, and I've watched it change over the years and everything. And I see the community coming, and you know, everything's thriving. Things are working in it to our advantage. But this crematorium that they're asking for, it is pollute, it will pollute the area. We have so many schools in this area. You know, and not only that, I am an asthma person myself. I walk every day, every day. I can't go out my house without this nebulizer, I mean, without this inhaler. I cannot go out of my house. And when, it, when my asthma really kicks up on me, I have to put on, you know, use my nebulizer. And it's like some, it's like an elephant sitting on my chest. I cannot breathe. So I'm asking you guys to please consider us, not just me, as a 64-year-old elderly lady in the community, think of, like they say, the kids. It is a known fact that the brown and black communities have a high impact of asthma. So you're not looking at our kids. You're not looking at our future. They're the future. That's what we should be looking at. And Vaughn Green, if you're still here, that's what you should be looking at them. You know, you have another place somewhere up there in Randallstown. Maybe there's a place right there. Like the gentleman said, what about the water? Maybe look into that. There are other avenues that you can use instead of putting this on your road where there's numerous traffic up and down polluting our community already. So I'm just asking you guys to please look out for us. Thank you. Okay, the next five people I'd like to call up, Yvonne Williams, Genevieve Yager, Bonnie Cody, forgive me if I'm messing up everyone's names, I'm so sorry, Zoe Friedman, and Drew schmidt Perkins. G-E-N-E-V-I-E-V-E-Y-A-E-G-E-R. 
So I come here today as a Rosebank neighbor, but I'm also an educator and school psychologist, so I'm really here to advocate on this cause for educational and developmental lens. What data do we have about the impact of the toxic pollutants that are emitted from a crematorium and on developing children? I personally don't know that, I'm asking them. Do we have accountable protocol and policies in place to be mindful of our children when they commute from home to school or ensuring air quality safety when these children go outside for any learning opportunities or any recreational opportunities? We have several schools located within a close vicinity to the business, a majority of them that sit in what we call the right wing of the Alma Butterfly. There is significant data out there confirming that ingesting and being exposed to toxic chemicals as we develop are detrimental not only to a child's development, but their physical development, their cognition, and how they develop in the brain, and of course their emotional development. We also have data and first-hand experience from just me as a teacher, but let's be real, we've got the data everywhere to confirm that our communities in that butterfly wing are already disproportionately impacted and disadvantaged by these chemicals, right? We've got the data that we've been talking about. I also know that as someone who wants to plan and start my own family, I have to consider this as well, right? For my own body safety and as well, if I'm wanting to bring someone into this life, do I really want to start a family where I know the air quality is not as stellar? Um, I know that if these conditions get worse, I'm really lucky. I have the accessibility to leave and re relocate if needed. That's not what I want to do. I want to invest in this community. That's why I'm here tonight. I also know that other neighbors don't have that same luxury, nor do they want to even think that way. This is our community. We want to preserve it and make sure it can last for generations to come. I respect the fact that Von Green is doing what they can as a business to honor the dead, but I'm more concerned about its potential impact on those who are living today. My name is Bonita Cody. I, my A's are terrible, so that's why you said Bonnets. Sorry. <laughs> um, I, I, I live in B-O-N-I-T-A-C-O-D-Y. I've sat through a number of these meetings. I'm not going to go over any of those things or even read this, but I just want to say that our community is vulnerable, very much so. And I listen to everything, and I think a lot of the people who request cremation don't really understand what they're doing to the community. There, it's, a, it's a financial issue, I understand those things, but until I really started working with the committee did I really understand the, the, the problems. So, so I think that's one, you know, you can serve your constituents, but they really don't know what they're doing. Uh, I guess the other thing is um, MDE as a state uh, agency, I really think you're caught between a rock and a hard place. Um, and until, and I'm going to wear my shirt until we change the state law. Yeah. Okay? Because it's an incinerator. It's an incinerator. And there's nothing we, but there's nothing we really can do. That's what I've decided. Our community is just going to be impacted. And hopefully, we can, with these meetings, we can lessen it as much as possible. But we have to change the laws. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Yvonne Williams, Y-V-O-N-N-E, Williams. That's easy, it's easy to spell. Um, I don't have anything written. In fact, um, on the um, sign-in sheet, it said, do you have a comment, yes or no? I just put maybe, because I wanted to see how things were going. I hear all the comments that um, everyone is making and they're good comments because everyone in here is concerned about the community. And it seems like everything is done. You know, we, we're, gonna, we're doing a lot of talking and MD has already made the decision. Um, it seems like Von Green could care less about this community. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't live in the, around here. How many hours do, does he spend at the funeral home on York Road? He has numerous funeral homes all over this, all, all over the Maryland area. So he won't be breathing in what's coming out these exhaust pipes. Um, very, a very short time. We live here. We will be breathing this 24 7. You know, it's not good. And I think when businesses 
have money, they get what they want. Mm -hmm. They get what they want, no matter what the community says. He has a business in this community, and he's, he's saying, you know, he's concerned about the community. No, you're not, because if you were concerned, you wouldn't put this in our community. We have people with health issues. We have many elderly people in the area. And this is going to, it's going to take place. It's going to take place no matter how much we talk about it because money talks, money moves things. We don't have the money that Vaughn Green has. Vaughn Green lives way away from the smokestacks that's going to be up here. So that's all I have to say. I mean, we can talk till we blew in the face, but it's going to happen. People, I don't know, people just don't, businesses just don't care. They just want to make the money. He can very well put these things out away from um, communities. He gets up here and he says, um, people who want cremation, they don't like the air where you have to transport the bodies here. Hey, these people just want cremate that their their loved ones cremated. You know, that's just an excuse. That's just an excuse. But that's all I have to say. But we can continue to talk. We can continue to talk. But it's gonna happen. Hi everyone, good evening. My name is Zoe Friedman, C-O-E-F-R-I-E-D-M-A-N. Um, I live across the street from Vaughn Green, across from York Road. I can see it from my dining room and my living room window. And um, I'm just so deeply disappointed that this permit went through. I, I was really holding out hope for the past two years. I was just thinking, there's no way they're gonna be able to do this. <laughs> just thought there's just no way. And it is, it's happening. So I really request that um, MDE puts as many restrictions on this as possible. Um, I live in my house with my husband and my three-year-old son, and I would like there to be um, scheduled times where I know that the incinerator is not running so that I can open my windows and have some fresh air come in or play outside with my son and know that we're breathing clean air uh, at least one day a week, two days a week, few hours a day. Um, I think there, got, there have to be many more restrictions on this to make us all feel like we are happy to continue to live here. That's why I moved to that community because so I, so I could raise my son there. Thank you. Good evening, Drew Schmidt Perkins. I will spell that. D R U S C H M I D T hyphen Perkins P E R K I N S, and that's the short version of my name. When I first heard about this proposal, I was instantly appalled. Um, but then I thought, no, 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 come on, you're smart. Let's learn about this. Let's see what the real issues are. People, I have changed my end-of-life documents to forbid cremation. Mm -hmm. yeah. I had no idea. I also learned that my car, my Subaru, has more pollution control standards than this crematorium. Crema crema mm -hmm. My son-in-law is beat up as hell, 24-year-old truck has more pollution controls than this crematorium. And I have to get my car inspected regularly. Yes. I may not borrow my neighbor's car for that inspection. Okay. I mean, this is crazy, <laughs> right? This is wild. This is really wild, people. Um, I do appreciate, MBE, the steps that you have taken to try to do better on this. Um, but if this is how good it can get, I'm now really freaked out. 
And just think about all the other communities out there with crematoriums that do not have these benefits. So MBE, your next steps, your to-do list, one, fix these standards. It is outrageous that these standards are what this industry is being based on. It's outrageous. 30 years old? No. Let's get together. Let's fix these standards, have real protective standards. Yes. Two, environmental justice can no longer be just a score. MDE, you need to be working with the environmental justice community on legislation to have real environmental justice respect and changes to regulation. Three, cumulative impacts matter. A single pollution source cannot be the only determinant. If there's 28 other pollution sources, we have to take that into account. Mr. Green, my family used your services. We didn't give a damn that my grandmother wants someone else to be cremated. It just was immaterial. How do you think, if this is really so important, that all those Baltimore County people would feel about being cremated in Baltimore City? Mm. <laughs> Sorry, that's a little flippant and a little unfair, but I, that was just kind of an appalling remark. So MBE, you have work to do on this community. We're going to keep working. Uh, Senator Washington, we're going to keep working. We appreciate all your efforts over the session. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next batch of folks that have signed in saying that they would like to make a statement. Um, <clears throat> Lisa Poliak, Angela Pengalia, oh, forgive me, I'm so sorry. Um, Sandy McFadden, um, and Anna Barker. Hi, good evening. My name is Poliak. That's uh, L I S A P O L Y A K. Uh, I'm an environmental engineer and a public health scientist, and for the last 35 years, I worked for the Army and DOD uh, curtailing environmental exposures for service members. But today I'm here in a private capacity uh, providing some advice to the York Road Partnership. And I want to start by thanking the folks at MDE for the effort that they put into making this draft permit more comprehensive than any air permit that's currently issued to any territory in Maryland. And I say that as a person who's read nearly all of those permits. Uh, we think it's a good start and it ushers in some new thinking about environmental justice and how it can and should be a factor in achieving your mission to protect the health of Marylanders. But we also believe that the improvements can be made um, because this permit, frankly, is affecting vulnerable families who live, as you've heard, less than 200 feet from the emissions that are gonna be produced by this crematorium incinerator. And make no mistake, it is an incinerator. Uh, however, I want to address two issues that relate to the state of the regulation of crematory incinerators in Maryland right at this time, and these remarks are specifically for MDE. And the first is that there's only one emission limit right now for crematories in MDE regulations. It's for total particulate matter. And it hasn't been updated in over 30 years. You heard someone mention that earlier. It was promulgated in 1991. And that was six years before EPA published a single regulation on fine particulate matter, which is PM 2.5. So this regulation is significantly out of date. Not only that, but nearby states and EPA themselves, when EPA issue permits to tribal nations, regulate crematory emissions at a fraction of the level that Maryland does. MDE needs to update the crematory emission limit for particulate to reflect current science and current medicine. The science is out there. Maryland just hasn't needed to address it because crem cremation hasn't been uh, a big industry until recently. But right now we know that there's close to 116 air permits for crematories in the state of Maryland at this time. And all of them have fewer restrictions than the permit that we're potentially getting in, uh, in the city right now. 
The second thing that MDE needs to do is stop allowing crematory operators to use those outdated emission factors to demonstrate that they're meeting regulatory limits. Notwithstanding that MDE has tried to do a good job coordinating with Marama about best practices, I've seen that document. That best practices document is just recy recycling and recirculating those old 30-year emission factors. They're 30 years old. They were done on one, one uh, crematory incinerator back in New Jersey in 1992. The, the reason that they haven't been updated is there hasn't been a groundswell of need. EPA hasn't put the money into it. The states might not have the money into it, but something needs to be done to update the emission factors. They're irrelevant. They bear no resemblance, especially since most crematories today have they're, they're managing human remains that include medical devices, that include many, many metals that are not reflected in those current emission factors. And I'm going to ask for an extra minute of indulgence. Can I have that? Please. Yes. yes. Okay, you need to know that right now there's a whole industry called crematory recycling where crematories give up the ash that's produced in their crematoriums to recyclers and scrap metals where they extract the metals that are in that ash for money. And by their, own, by their own estimates, sometimes as much as $100,000 a year can be made by recycling the ash and, the, and extracting the metals that are in it. Things like um, cobalt and titanium and, and nickel and silver and gold and platinum and palladium. I asked some reps from MDE earlier, do you know, is anybody in Maryland uh, doing this practice? Because the takeaway here is that if these metals are in the crematory ash and you can make money for them, they are most certainly going up the stack. And those emission factors that are in that best practices documents bear no resemblance to all of those things that are going up the stack. So I'm asking you, MDE, you need to find out if crematories in Maryland at this time are recycling their ash to make money off of the metals that are in that ash. Because those folks, when they do that, in addition to the check that they get, they get a lab analysis that tells them exactly the chemical elements that are in there and the amounts. So there is there is scientific evidence of the amount of metals that are in the ash and that are going to the stack. I thank you for the extra time. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good evening. My name is Angela Panaglia, A-N-G-E-L-A-P-I-N-A-G-L-I-A. Oh, it's okay. No one will pronounce it. All right. I live about a thousand feet from Von Green in the Radnor Winston neighborhood. I found my version of the quote unquote American dream here in Baltimore. I'm actually from Florida, but my spouse and I moved here back in 2016. And in 2021, at the age of 40, we were finally able to become homeowners in Radnor Winston. Like most of the housing here in Baltimore, it's old. We found mold, asbestos, chipping lead paint after we bought the place. <laughs> But we did what we had to do to make our home safe on the inside. We fixed what we could control. Because a few months after moving in, our child was born, our dream complete. And I remember driving around the neighborhood back then, seeing random lawn signs about crematoriums, and thought, hmm, there must be a lot of activists in this neighborhood, and this would be a really far away problem. Because frankly, the idea of a crematorium being built so close to where we just had moved in to was like simply preposterous. The idea of a crematorium right off of busy York Road, surrounded by neighborhoods with children and families, is preposterous. Now, I'm not opposed to cremation. My own father was cremated back in Florida. But I am opposed to cremation happening right next to where people live. Now, as you fine-tune this permit and do the maths, please remember your mission, MDE's mission, to protect and restore the environment for the health and well-being of all Marylanders. I want you to imagine yourself, and I don't know who I'm speaking to because I can't really see MD people except for you, Shan. <laughs> I want you to imagine yourself living next door to the crematorium. Imagine your young children or grandchildren playing outside, your elderly parents gardening, yourself barbecuing after a long work week. Imagine yourself dreaming up the rest of your life in a home you never even thought you would own. We fix the things we can control, but this is beyond me and my neighbors. This is where MD has to step up and protect us. Remember that you serve the living. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. 
My name is Sandy McFadden, S-A-N-D-I, not Y. And last name McFadden, M-C, capital F-A-D-D-E-N. I have been a resident of the Govins community for about 30 years or so. And I have been involved in the leadership of the York Road Partnership, where I serve now on the Board of Directors. I am also the Vice President of the mid Dovins Community Association. And I have been the Community School Coordinator for Govins Elementary School for almost the last nine years. And I am recently retired three weeks ago. <laughs> Thank you. I want to ask a question tonight um, <clears throat> as I was thinking about this because I, I actually didn't want to do, do this. I, I've been testifying about this crematorium now for I guess almost four years now. Um, we have been to Annapolis and thank you very much Senator. You have been amazing. Thank you for your support to our community. We have testified in the Senate, we have testified in the House of Delegates, and we continue to say the same thing. The question that I would raise is this. What is the risk with the installation of a crematorium in the heart of our community? And I, along with many of my neighbors, and partner organizations have spent thousands of volunteer hours working to bring investment to this community. And we are very proud to say that we have two brand new uh, 21st century schools in our neighborhood. We have secured millions of dollars in state funding for neighborhood improvements. And we have led initiatives with partners to receive down payment assistance to encourage renters to become homeowners in our neighborhood. Several blocks from the crematorium site have been designated as part of the Healthy Neighborhoods programs to help build home ownership and attract new families. What is at risk? Well, all of this. All of this is at risk. Young families may not want to live in a community that they think is environmentally unsafe for their children and their families all together. And they are concerned that what they are hearing about air pollution control and all of the things that we've been discussing may be very potentially damaging to their family and to the, family, to the health of the family. All of the investments that I just talked about, and there's so many more, they're all catching up on decades of disinvestment from redlining and structural racism in our neighborhood. Your own environmental justice score says that this is one of the worst communities to locate a new pollution source. We've heard that over and over this evening. If MDE, will not deny this permit request, then it has to place conditions in the permit that, make strong, that makes it strong and clear possible health, possible that the health and well-being of our neighborhoods and our community will be a priority concern for you. You need to know that in the midst of all that we're doing and all that is being proposed, we will be watching for accountability and compliance. Mm -hmm. So my name is Anik Barker, A-N-N-I-C-K-B-A-R-K-E-R. And I, I, I want to address um, the reluctance I see in the permit as it's written right now. And it's puzzling to me. Because what I see is a nod to, yes, there should be some limits on a crematory placed within a densely populated community, um, of which I am a part. 
But then it stops short. And there's this profound reluctance and fear, I would almost say, to, to do the right thing, to do the common sense thing, and say, yes, of course we will monitor the stack on a regular basis. And of course we will make that data publicly available to the community that is affected by the emissions of that stack. Of course we will spell out exactly which emissions we are monitoring and what the what their levels will and, and we will we will do our darndest to make sure that the permitted levels are as stringent as possible because we know and we fully understand that this is an enormous imposition on this community. Frankly, it should not exist, period. There are limits to our power, but we will use our, the, our power to the fullest extent. And MDE, this is your responsibility and your reluctance to impose these very common sense measures is, is frankly baffling. And I hope that you will find the wisdom, the courage, and the will to do the right thing. Thank you. It's T-E-R-R-Y, W-E-I-S-S-E-R. Um, I have heard a lot of really um, quite um, important questions and uh, uh, recommendations that I um, really support here. There's one thing that hasn't been mentioned that I just wanted to bring up, and that is that I feel that the um, Maryland Department of Environment and uh, Vaughn Green both are putting a great deal of faith in an equipment company. Um, I have one thing to say about that. They seem to, to feel that there is, uh, that this company is uh, been vetted and important and special. Uh, one thing to say, Boeing. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Myrna Newman, and I live in the Wilson neighborhood parking community, York Road corridor. And my concern is, is that I want to point out that MDE, Vaughn Green, you all don't live in this community. But if you did, would you want this crematorium in your backyard? I have rolled around the community and other counties, and I see those people in Hartford County, they don't want crematoriums in their backyards. So why would you all want to allow a crematorium here on this York Road corridor in these people's backyards? I live here. I don't want it. It needs to be moved. If the permit needs to be denied, I thank you. Hello, my name is Franklin Smith, F-R-A-N-K-L-I-N-S-M-I-T-H. I'm 70 years old and I've lived in the, in the Goldman's community for 68 years. I've seen a lot of things come and a lot of things go. I understood when you were saying it's about, you know, the families and not taking the body somewhere else to be done and all of that. I was listening to all that, and it showed a lot of concern. But like I said, I lived there a long time. And I remember not long ago, you had drug dealers sitting right there on your property selling drugs 24-7. That wasn't important. That's our community. That's what I have a problem with. Because you say you're doing one thing, but I've seen something totally different. Anybody who ever turned that corner, they know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's still some activity going on there. Right yeah. So like I said, you know, I understand why all of a sudden, yeah, it, it cleaned up a little bit, most likely because of this. Let's get the crem crematorium there. But I know what I saw, I know how it stayed there, and now all of a sudden since all this talk, it's been lightened up a little bit. And you care for the community. If 
país. Uh, my name is Jed Galen, J-E-D-G-A-Y-L-I-N. So I live uh, in Radnor Winston, and I just want to speak directly to Mr. Green. Um, I want to thank you. Uh, I didn't see what, at the other meetings. I want to thank you for having the courage to come out here and listen to what we have to say. And I want to say something a little different to you, which is that you've heard the tip of the iceberg the fraction of the tip of the iceberg of our community coming and saying, we don't like this, we're concerned. People who have used your services, our senator, who has served this community, you know, all of us, with such dedication. And they're saying, we don't like this. And I'm saying, imagine something else. It's not too late, Mr. Green. You could come up right now and say, I've been not sleeping over this. Work with us, imagine. If you were to say, I'm pulling off this, I'm going to explore, I don't know anything about water crematorium. This is the first I've heard of it, but I'm interested. How can I work with this community so that I can meet the business needs that I want? Do you know what you would get from this community if you pull off this right now? Gratitude, PR, business, like you could not imagine. Come to us, please, I'm begging you. Thank you. So I'll try that. My name is Jean, J E A N, Lal, L A L L. And I live south of Radnor Winston in the northeast corner of Guilford. And I think I'm the only Guilford person that's spoken tonight, but I just wanted to say that I'm in deep sympathy with folks just a little north of us. Um, and I, but I started also from a position of sympathy with Vaughn Green because I attended a service there and I found their, their services to be admirable and worthwhile. Um, but I've had, um, I, I'm having real trouble with the, the pollution issue. Um, I've lived in, this, this month marks 50 years since I moved to Baltimore. I'm a Rocky Mountain girl, so I grew up with presumably clean air, though there was a lot of petroleum refining going on out there. But <clears throat> I moved to Baltimore 50 years ago. I brought up my little girl in a Lakeside near, near Northwood in Edna Gardens. And we dug in the backyard and got dirty and never worried. And when she went off to college, we bought our house in Guilford. And we wanted to be closer to the train station so my husband could commute to D.C. Um, and we, we took a, we were going to get our, our, the trim on our house painted. So they asked us to test and see if there was any lead in the paint. And the test showed that this, the paint was 7% lead. I don't think anybody ever made paint that was 7% lead. That was my, that was how I became aware that we were living four doors away from York Road and that we had half a century and more of, of vehicle or traffic going up and down York Road and depositing vast amounts of lead and other pollutants on our, our house and our land. So I, consequently, I never tried to grow tomatoes and vegetables in my lovely yard. I grow a lot of flowers. Uh, or I've learned to call because I'm now a Baltimorean, now, as I call them flares. So I grow a lot of flares in my yard, and I've become a real Baltimorean over the years. But I still remember what fresh air smelled like. And my 92-year-old husband every night wants to leave the windows open so we can have fresh air. And I can't quite explain to him that that's not a realistic expectation. And if even though we wouldn't live as close to the crematorium, I'm just already so aware, we are actually quite close, but I'm just so aware of the depth of the pollution that's already, that children, if, if I had little children now, I couldn't allow them to make mud pies in my backyard. 
it would not be safe. The ground is not safe. So I just want to say, <laughs> create so much of a, a, a scene here. I just want to say that I'm really sympathetic to uh, the, the business desire to, to serve the customers, and but I'm also deeply sympathetic to my fellow citizens who are living with even more pollution than I'm living with. And I do, I do want to ask a question, just for information purposes. Um, how many crematoria are there in Baltimore City? Uh, 20 years ago, 18 years ago, I carried a, a close friend to, to be, a, the body of a close friend to be cremated in um, the Greenmount Cemetery. As far as I know, that crematorium is there, but I'm just very curious to know, as we're going through these deliberations, how many crematoria are there in Baltimore City and how are they being regulated? So that's a question for the future. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Try to speak this way. This is off the cuff because I heard about this meeting uh, last night on, I believe, Channel 45. My name is uh, Reginald Jordan. I live in the Kenworth uh, Park uh, community. And before I start off with, uh, it's my personal feeling that cremation is increasing because the price of traditional funerals is off the chain now, right now. Most people can't afford it. Most people don't want cremation, but they, that's what they only can afford. Uh, we have, in this immediate area, we have two um, dialysis centers, two large uh, senior citizens in community within walking distance uh, of, of Bowling Green and where you're talking about uh, doing this. And the traffic well, uh, up and down the York Road corridor. Then the next thing I wanted to bring up, uh, uh, this had up here. I belong to Office Space Memorial Post 294. Post was named after Oprah Spitz, who was killed in Vietnam. And it's the only African American post in the, in the state of Maryland today. And one of the things that the people in here are familiar with is the PAC Act. And the PAC Act is dealing with the same thing what we're doing here today. The, for the service members that served in our country and it was, and it was exposed to pollutants, exposed to in, environmental things like asbestos. And it, since World War II, and it just happened to start today. And as a, I'm speaking uh, on behalf of Oval Springs, but at the same time, I am chairman of the uh, uh, Maryland Department of Veterans Affairs and the Rehabilitation uh, Commission. And one of the things I can tell you I will do, because I tried to get those statistics of how many veterans are living within the, in our Pacific area that basically is involved with the PAC Act and the impact that a uh, crematory can have as far as their health and the, and the psychological experiences of, of, of breathing, uh, bad air, and the smell of death. And I'm, I'm talking about but from, my, from the uh, veteran standpoint. And I will go back to the veteran community and, and, and foster some uh, help as far as how the veterans feel about a crematory in the middle of the city when you got places all out, outside that you want to bring into the middle of the city. I'm not going for that now. Thank you. Hello, my name is Donna Blackwell, and I am a resident of Winston Govins um, Improvement Association. And I'm also the vice president of the York Road Partnership. So my um, I've listened to the comments and I know everything is everything, but one of the things I want to point out to everyone is that it behooves MDE to update and make sure that they are monitoring what's going on. Because this is 2024, the 21st century, and you're using 30-year-old data? That, that does not compute in my mind either, and it should not be computing in yours. As everyone has stated before, we are here for our future. This is the living that we're, we're concerned about. If we don't do nothing now, what's, what's going to happen to our children's children's children? So we, it behooves all of us in this room 
especially MDE, up MDE to update their regulations and their monitoring practices. And I also want to throw out to my community, we need to start looking for green barriers. We need to direct, we need to direct what, where we're putting our money at. If, if Farm Green wants to cremate and they found a need, an economic need, then damn it, let's go ahead and do water cremation. If everybody makes it in their will, we're going to do water cremation. We want a green burial. What the hell are they going to do? They're going to go ahead and do it. Chelsea, hi, my name is Chelsea Hempel. I live on Rossiter Avenue, um, so right down the street from Vaughn Green. Uh, when I first moved here a couple of years ago, I was like, oh, that's a beautiful funeral home service, um, or it looked like a beautiful place. Uh, what I recently found out was that the reason why they're pushing for this um, project in our backyards is to better serve our community and the people who have died in our community. I completely understand that. But what I don't understand is why they're not uh, acknowledging the implications for the people that are still alive um, no. today. Uh, I live with a bunch of individuals who are way older than me. They've been breathing this air a lot longer than me and they have a lot of you know, health complications. I want to look out for them. I want to be the voice for them. But also, my neighbors have a bunch of kids. I mean, I don't understand what we're doing. And I understand that when this, these pollutants are put up into the air, this goes everywhere. Um, but I just get really upset when I look at my neighbors that I see every day um, who are already struggling with their health issues. Um, so, you know, I understand that this is pushing full steam ahead, um, but I think karma is the real thing, and I uh, am excited to see what transpires in the future. in the Guilford community. Um, I uh, have been sitting here tonight and I've really learned a lot even though I've been um, you know, involved somewhat in the opposition of this. Um, first of all, I just want to acknowledge the passion and the courage of the neighbors and community organizers who've been having a consistent drumbeat of opposition for four years on this yeah. topic. Um, so I'm a data person too. Um, two pieces of data that stood out to me tonight were that this MDE has assigned a 95 rating. So many people have referenced it tonight. And we're using 30-year-old data to create regulations. Why are we using, not using the data that we have and we're putting all of our emphasis around the data that we don't? Doesn't make any sense. I'm asking you all to do better. Good evening. My name is uh, Ed Flanagan, and um, I've been a member uh, of the community, if you will, of um, Old Homeland and Govins since uh, after the Army, 1972. And um, we are parishioners at uh, St. Mary's uh, Catholic Church on York Road. Um, and I lived in Florida for about 10 years, and then I came back to Baltimore because I had to have operations, etc., through the VA. And then we, uh, we bought a home on Lyman Avenue, if you all know where that was or is, by the, where the little firehouse, or the big fire, <laughs> and the little library there and so forth. So we really love the community. And uh, Spring Lake Way, and uh, the cathedral church as well, and so forth. And um, we just really do not believe 
that uh, von Grain, that there was any place for a crematorium in a residential neighborhood. Now, I know that there are businesses there for many years, many, many years. However, when a crematorium comes in, it just seems to me that it is a bit of a difference indeed with a Puma home, etc. And would it be taking on more people? I understand that uh, rules have been set, etc. and so forth. But one thing in the, the walk of life I've learned is change, that word change. And things can change. And the next thing you know, the more cases coming in, if you will, more bodies, etc. I don't think that that's particularly attractive in a residential area like Guilford or Homeland or Old Homeland or that area right there. And uh, so I'm totally, as I say, 153% against it. Thank you. take up the mic, but I had a brain blast. Um, my name's Genevieve Yeager again, and one of the thoughts I had was the fact that I, as a school psychologist, also operate under Comar. Um, what I find really silly is again and again and again, we've had many people come up here and ridicule the fact that they are doing decision making based off of 30-year-old data. Um, I mocked using assessment tools that are older than 10 years old, and I can't report off data that is older than three years old. And that's at a school-based level. So I'm curious to know why this branch of Comar is allowing themselves and holding themselves accountable to using 30-year data when I, as a public educator, am held to a much higher standard. I mean, that's, that's how it is in most parts of life, right? But I just find it so interesting when we're talking about an environment that's impacting everyone at all facets of life, right? That's one of the big things that I know is a point of contention with the upcoming election. I know it's a point of contention in ensuring a safe community here in Baltimore, right? Um, for me, I'm just wondering why are we using this old data, right, from an MDE perspective, especially when we know we've had the two hottest summers on record in the past few years, right? And that's not even talking about the other things in the air as it's hot and sticky and muggy. But I'm also wondering from a sense of, we call it fidelity in education, how am I ensuring that this crematorium is running the way it's supposed to? What are we doing to ensure accountability? How are we making sure they're doing things correctly? We just had an environmental engineer come up here earlier saying that, listen, money's money. I love money. If I can sell metals and make extra money on the side, why wouldn't I if there's nothing regulating me to do so? What are the consequences if I don't follow fidelity? Right? And unfortunately, even if we put in some monetary consequences, it doesn't stop a child ingesting or taking in those fumes or an adult or marginalized you know, communities. We can try to put a monetary you know, slap on the wrist, but that doesn't stop it, you know, me ingesting it or other community members. So I'd be curious to know what are we doing to ensure that fidelity of implementation of using the crematorium? And also when does MDE plan to update their data to make data-based decision making? Because last time I checked, I get a pretty big slap on the wrist if I use 30-year-old data, because shocker, population changes, environment changes. So, what are we doing to move forward? Okay, folks, um, are there more people that would like to make a statement for the record tonight? You certainly can. <laughs> I have just a question. Some people have said that the decision is made. Oh, sorry. I wanted to clarify. Um, a, a permit has not been issued. Is that no, it is correct. Right. Okay, so the permit still has not been issued. Um, and, and we're of the position that it should not be. So we've worked at it. You've worked hard for four more years, and I know it gets hard, uh, but you know it takes time. Um, but continue. This is not over. This is not over. Um, and just wanted to clarify that a permit has not been issued. Uh, that this is considered a, um, just a sample, right? So there, therefore, I just wanted to clarify. So therefore, the applicant should not assume, based on this preliminary approval, 
that they can move forward, that they, that they will necessarily get an, appro an approval. Is that correct? That this is not, the two are not related. In other words, if one gets a, this conditional, well not conditional, just this temporary this is, so draft. This is the draft. Um, they're they're going to review everything, and um, you guys can hear me. And um, at the end of the comment period, all the comments you guys have put in, I guess I put in. So at the end of the comment period, um, all of the written comments we receive and all of the uh, comments placed here tonight will be reviewed and a, a final determination will be made after that. So this is not the final determination, this is just the public hearing at this point. Sorry. Again, there has been no final determination. Uh, information that was just, I just want to clarify and just... that be a final determination? It could be months because there's so much to review. Oh, easily more, though, because there's so much. Just to clarify, a final determination has not been made. Um, as part of the review, any information, new information that is coming to you has to be considered as a part of that final determination. Correct. Correct. And just, again, clarifying that there should not be any construction or, or uh, assumption on the part of the applicant that they can by virtue of this temporary uh, determination should move forward. So they should not move forward with any acquisition or any additional building or construction or incur any costs during this period until the final determination is made. Would that be correct? I don't know what you mean by costs. Well, in other words, in a, what, what I've heard in some of these debates, what I've heard in some of these hearings is not a concern about the applicant having made some expenditures uh, and therefore it would be not fair to the applicant uh, to then not give them the final, to not make the final approval. I just wanted to clarify that in this instance that, the, that there are no, and that we're putting very on notice that no, no expenditures or anything should be made until a final determination. Would that be correct? Um, yeah, if yes. an applicant chooses to purchase equipment or whatever before they have a permit, then that's on them. Okay. They are not allowed to install or operate unless they have a permit. And the fact of a, of a, of a, of a purchase of equipment or expenditure on ex, uh, of, uh, consultants or plans or anything uh, is, is incumbent on the applicant and again, is not to be considered as a part of the deliberation of whether or not to right. approve the final. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Pauline Saunders, P-A-U-L-I-N-E-S-A-U-N-D-E-R-S. This is so unlike me. I do not speak out like this. But I had to say something. Now, Mr. Von Green, he is not a monster. He's a nice man, from what I understand. I've been to many services at his establishment. I haven't had to use it, but I had to tell my son, when something happens to me, then that's where I wanted to go. I can walk to his establishment from where I live, but I do not want crematory in the neighborhood where houses are adjacent, they're right there. I, I asked my pastor, would you want one right next door to you? I mean, think about it. I mean, the, I, I said, there, he's got one place on your um, Route 40, uh, Liberty Road, and there's plenty of land. We, the parking lot is not that big right there, you know. Sometimes you have to wait for someone to leave so you can go in. I, he's a nice man, but I just don't want, I live on Winston Avenue. I can walk to his establishment, but I don't want one in my neighborhood where I can smell the man smells. But I, it's still there, whether I smell it or not, it's there. Yeah. So, and I'm, I'm still thinking about having my son take care of you. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so.
so I could answer it tonight. But um, as far as like written comments when those go in, is there going to be like receipt of that so the question was, if you are sending in comments as part of the formal record, um, will you get an acknowledgement? I will be sending an acknowledgement back out saying, thank you for your comments. You'll have a, a record of when they're in. And again, um, we have until August 29th to ex uh, Excuse me. <laughs> Wait, try that one again. Um, October 22nd to send in comments to me. And if you've already sent in comments, you can amend them and add more, no problem at all. Um, and if anyone would like to come up tonight and have, you know, just, um, add your comments to the record here, we have time. Can we also get like a full record of how many people have comments and to have that transparency to see everyone's comments? I can probably put something together at the end when I've received everything um, and make it available, sure. And that can be on the website? Um, or I'll email it out to everybody. I'm not sure what we'll do yet, but I'll make sure people get it, sure. It would just be nice to know how many people have submitted comments, what the comments mm -hmm. were. Um, we've heard some comments that there is. There, there will be a response to comments document that summarizes all the comments that were received. So every comment that be, that's been that and that would be posted yeah. online. I mean, they may be grouped in what may not be every specific comment, but if there, there's somebody that asked about the EJ score, so we would have a general answer for that one to take care of everybody's concern, or, you know, the, the um, I guess it was the, the, the year for the emissions data, and that would be, you know, so it may not be very specific, like 122 people's different comments, but it could be, you know, this is the discussion, these were the concerns, and our answer, all the way through the, yeah. all and the of tabulation of like how many people commented and came and all of that. So yeah. showing the, the, the yeah. Yep, this is all public records, so yes, we can do that. Yeah. Okay, and again, if anyone else would like to make a statement tonight to put into the record, you're welcome to come up. You can ask questions as part of your testimony, um, but they won't be answered directly tonight. That's what that goes into that response to comments document, so that. Oh, well, if you want, okay, well, look, I'm, I'm gonna back up really quick. For the people who ask questions as part of their testimony, um, we will address that so that everybody who is interested gets to hear what that question was and what the answer is to it. Um, so that's why we don't answer them at the, at the, during the, the testimony part tonight. Um, but if you have a question that's not related to testimony, if you want to, we'll be here. I can talk with you afterward. Okay. Sure. So. Anybody else want to come up? Hi there. <laughs> thank you. Oh, okay. Well, I want to thank everyone for your time tonight. I appreciate you coming out. And um, take my business cards on the tables out front. Feel free to give me a call or send me an email. Thank you very much.